Happy to have you all with us. Ben Ingram here and joining us today, Ryan Klesko. It's our pleasure to have you here, uh, Ryan. And thanks so much for the time. How are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. Just running around, enjoying the beautiful day and uh, trying to spend as much time as I can in the outdoors. Uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nice. It's, it's nice to see that they're, they're trying to do something, uh, try to get some, some things going with baseball, and, and there's still a little bit of hope, I think. Yeah, I'm excited about that, too. I mean, lots of good momentum in the right direction. We all want baseball really soon. And in the meantime, it's given us an opportunity to go back and look at things that have happened in the past. And you had that opportunity just last week. I know that uh, on Fox Sports Southeast, they relived the entire 1995 World Series night by night. And for game six, most of the team was there on a Zoom call. How did that go? It was good. It was good. We were just talking about earlier. There was a lot of guys that uh, that like to hear themselves talk and, and, and the guys that <laughs> – and then, of course, and there's other guys that kind of take a lot of the a lot of the abuse, like Fred McGriff. I think they're all over Freddie, but but uh, but poor Fred couldn't get his app working, and he he was even watching the game. But and then there was a couple guys that couldn't get in at all, you know, from out of state, or they couldn't watch the game. So it was pretty comical to see everybody try to try to communicate. There was some delays, there was some other stuff going on, but everybody's watching the game, and and uh, I know everybody's busting everybody's chops about the strike. I know everybody's giving uh, Glavin a hard time about the big strike zone and, and then other guys, you know, so it, it was, it was fun to, to be able to talk to the guys and see the guys, you know, uh, Greg McMichael's done such a great job with keeping the alumni strong and together. So we generally get to see each other quite often, uh, very strong alumni program, uh, Mike Plant, uh, and, and some of the other, Bra the Braves guys have, um, uh, really, uh, in for and really, went after that and said, hey, McMichael, we want to have one of the strongest alumni in all of Major League Baseball. And they started uh, when once Greg McMichael stepped in and, and worked with Mike Plant and a lot of the other guys, Derek Schiller, uh, I think it became something really fun. You know, I, I played for the Padres, uh, nothing against those guys, but, I mean, I played for them for six years and, and felt that, you know, it was, a, it was a great time. But, I mean, you hardly hear from any, any of that, that team anymore. So, they're, in my opinion, they're, they're alumni – uh, is not really strong yet. It, it's kind of unfortunate because there's a lot of players that still live around that, that area. But I've just I try to give them some examples of saying, hey, they should be more like um, the, Le the Yankees alumni, the Atlanta Braves alumni, and, and and keep it you know keep them out in the community and and and, and having days where the where a lot of the players sign autographs and come in and and a lot of the fans like to see the former Braves and the former team out there. And so we we spend a lot of time at the baseball field, and I think we enjoy it. We get to bring our family out. Well, it's a really special bond that you guys have. How much of that is due to the fact that you guys won together and won so often back in the day? It, it, you know, it plays a big factor on it because obviously there's a lot of winning. There's a lot of um, – and during that era, and there still is, um, and, and there's a lot – there's a good bond there. Uh, that team stuck together for the, for the basis for long periods of time, and I think the fans enjoy seeing that group of guys together. Um, it's almost like a soap opera, you know. A lot of teams have a lot of turnovers. And so you got guys coming in, guys that coming out. And that's, and that's unfortunate. But sometimes when you're a smaller market club, you can't afford to keep the key players around a lot. And Ted Turner did a great job with, with keeping a lot of those key players together. John Scherholz, Bobby Cox, they did whatever it took to, take the, to try to keep the main keys to, uh, key players together. I want to go back to your performances in the postseason in 1995. I mean, you had a great postseason. You're 24 years old. Uh, I can't imagine that that's easy to just jump into a postseason and rake the way you did, man. Was, was there a certain amount of nerves to overcome? And once you got rolling, did, did you feel like your competence was there to maintain that kind of hot streak? Yeah, you know, I, and, I, and you haven't seen those games since they were over. I mean, I mean, my son said I saw some highlights on YouTube. He's 11 years old and plays for the, the making pain travel ball team uh, that I coach now. And there's a, we've got a bunch of, you know, we've got nine U, 10 U, 11, all the way up to like 14 U with a friend of mine, Mike Green, uh, pitched a little bit in the minor leagues. But, uh, you know, it's one of those things to where, you know, you go out there and have fun and, 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 and with the, and with the travel ball and everything, you know, it, it kind of goes in and through that and, uh, and it, it keeps everybody together. Um, and, and goes from there. You mentioned watching that game the other night, and that's the first time you'd watched it since you saw it live. Is that right? Yeah. So, like I said, other than the YouTube stuff, so I was, I was reliving it, and a lot of that stuff I forgot. I, and I, I don't remember not getting hits for the first two games. So when we did the first Zoom <laughs> thing that, that on, on the radio, they are like, well, 
you might not – because they, they'd heard me say about watching the games with my son, they said, well, they might not want to play uh, watch the first couple games because you didn't get any hits. And I was like, oh, that's right. <laughs> you know, so st- you're talking about stress levels. So, so it's like you're like a little kid living it all over again. I mean, not, you can say whatever you want, but when you get in the World Series, you're like – you turn into a kid. You got anxiety. You got excitement. You're trying to – you're trying to – I mean, you got to pull all that in, and everybody deals with it differently. I'm not going to name names, but you got some guys – going up and throwing up in between innings because their nerves are getting to them or some guys are getting sick before the games or some guys aren't sleeping before the night before the game because there's so much leading up to it because you've dreamed you've dreamt about this your whole life and for me the first couple games I'm not getting any hits I'm over swinging they're throwing me a lot of off-speed pitches and I think one of the guys Joe Morgan and one of the guys asked me what are you going to try to do different I said I'm just going to have to stay back and try to start hitting some balls the other way back up the middle it's going to get me back on track it's going to you know, um, and, and it's going to, you know, and, and you got to hold those emotion backs because you're, you got pitchers coming in the World Series, they're overthrowing, and that's not good, right? When you're trying to overthrow the baseball, you're hanging sliders, you're missing location, you got hitters coming in, you're seeing a pitch that you're going to hit, and you just maybe do a little bit, you try to do a little bit too much with it. And I think that's what happened to me the first couple games. And then I got that, and then I finally ripped the ball back up the middle, and here goes Omar Vizquel diving up the middle, getting up and throwing me out. And I'm thinking, oh my God, am I ever going to get a hit in this World Series? And and I finally got a I think I think I finally got a base hit up the middle, uh, and then and then the next I think the next two or three swings were home runs, uh, so it just it, you know it gave me a little bit of confidence. It took the monkey off my my back and uh, gave me you know oh my I finally got a hit. That's all you know. Let's win, but you know it's more pressure building up, and everybody deals with it. And so that's why they say more experienced teams that have been there have a little bit better chance to win because. They've been through that, and they know how to kind of calm their nerves a little bit. They've been there before. But whether you've gone – there's a, a little bit of truth to that. But, man, I was in three of them. And the same, it was almost the same feeling every time. It was maybe – there was a little more knowledge of what to feel, you know, expect from myself and try, and try to, okay, don't do that again. Don't overswing again. Let's not get there and, over, you know, don't over – the pitchers maybe don't overthrow the pitch and hang it over the middle of the plate. So there's that type of stuff too. Uh, and, and it did help, you know, I would imagine it did help Smolty and Glavin and some of the guys that were in the 91 and 92 World Series that kind of lived some of that out and, uh, and and it was already there. So maybe they weren't quite as nervous. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Right. Going back to that World Series, everybody was talking about the Braves pitching versus the, the Indians' bats. Were, I mean, were you guys, you, Chipper, uh, David Justice, were you guys thinking, man, we can hit the ball pretty well too? Was there ever a moment where you felt like, it's not just the Braves pitchers are the, that are the reason that this team is here. Well, if you look over history, you know, good pitching is going to outweigh good, good uh, you know, good, good hitting. But that you got to remember that that's what people are talking about in the series. I think they're talking about that, that, that team hit, hit. I mean, that was a bomb squad. I mean, we just got done seeing right. the Rockies. The, we just got done barely beating the Rockies in the first round of the playoffs, and they had a bomb squad. I think who they, I mean, look at that team. They go back and look at the Colorado Rockies in 95. Dante Bichette, Ellis Burks. I mean, I think I don't. I don't know if Alice uh, Galarraga was still. They had a bomb squad too, and so it was a battle back and forth. Um, but a lot of times, good pitching will shut down good hitting. But just remember, they had Oral Hershiser, so, you know what? Cy Young or, or or top runner Dennis Martinez. Same thing. These guys were. I mean, it was one nothing, two to one. You know, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of offense going around because the guys were making their pitches. I don't really think there was a. I don't think there was a game that was like ten to five or nine to eight or something. They would, and you would expect that. And they would, they talked about how how good their hitting was. I know a little that we were off a little bit offensively that year, that year compared to some of the other years, um, uh, numbers wise. You know, you got Fred McGriff, Javi, Chipper, myself. You had a bomb. We had, well, I thought we had a pretty a good bomb squad going going in. Uh, except you know, and of course Blouser was hurt. Uh, but we had a good team that year. We weren't a, we didn't have the numbers we usually have offensively. Marquise Grissom at any given time could hit 300. He was off number wise. DJ was off numbers wise. We were off numbers wise, stats wise. But in my heart, I knew that we were a better hitting team that we showed on paper that year. Remember, we moved into that stadium. That was the first year we went, or the, or the second year we were going into that other, or, or the other stadium, the new stadium coming up. And I think we had some injuries and guys went through some things. But normally. You know, we're not a career 250 team. We're more like a 260, 270, 280 team With if you look at the careers of all those players. So I think that they were kind of harping on that a little bit too much. Uh, we had a, that, that year. But, I mean, we knew that we could win with that pitching. We really did. 
Oh, you did. And like you said, you're able to relive that last week watching it. You mentioned that there are some things that you saw and maybe you're, you'd forgotten about. Can you give us an example of something that you watched play out that you completely forgot happened? Or maybe you thought in your mind all these years went a different way, but watching it, it refresh your memory. Oh, man. I don't remember. I don't remember. Uh, I didn't remember Glavin going in the coming in the dugout saying, you know, give me, you know, it's kind of the, the famous saying, I just need one, guys. I mean, he was on his game. And I know the guys were giving him a hard time about the strike zone. He pitches, he pitched unbelievable. I didn't remember, I didn't remember it there for a while because it was somebody, I don't remember Chipper running into, uh, was it Mad Dog for that, you know, I think it was in the first game. Uh, I did, little small stuff like that, I can't really remember because, again, we haven't, they haven't re aired it, and at least I haven't seen it being re aired. And so there was a lot of little small stuff uh, that, that's popping up like that, you know. Um, you know, and, and so it was it was interesting to, to read to watch the games because I re honestly couldn't tell you what was really going to happen. I can I remember a couple of my hits um, and I don't remember. <laughs> and I, you know, I don't remember. I, I remember I remember the, a couple of the home runs. I know that I, I took out by or for scale like two or three times breaking up double plays because you go back then. I mean, you're, you're trying to break that double play up and you're, you're going after them. Nowadays, you don't can't really do that. But, uh, you know, I mean, if the catcher's blocking the plate, you go after him. Your whole idea is to break up that double play so that so they don't get that double play. You're in the World Series, play as hard as you can. It's almost like, you know, it's, you know, you break it up, and hopefully you don't hurt anybody. But your objective is to knock that guy off the second base before he gets rid of that ball. I want you to tell us how difficult it is to have that accomplishment of winning the World Series because when you guys want it, I mean, whether it's you or Chipper, some of the other young guys, you're very early in your careers, and I'm sure it would have been very easy to think, man, we did it this year. We should be here every single year and, and do this every single year. But at the same time, looking back on it, how hard is it to achieve winning a World Series? <laughs> well, obviously, after your career is over and you look and you go, well, you were there. I think we were there three times. Uh, and then, of course, several, you know, pennant races and, and, and you know, playoff. And, you know, you always look back and say, woulda, shoulda, coulda. But thank God we won the one or else we'd have been the, what the Buffalo Bills of baseball. Like everybody was saying all these things. But, you know, it's hard. It's hard. It, it, it's hard to go out there and and be the best team in all of baseball. I mean, you've got all these things, you know, the, 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 that happened. Uh, you, momentum changed everything. And you, and you look back and say, man, I was glad we won that one because the other two that I was in, some of these guys were in, I think, five, what, five, five of them. Some of them maybe even six. Mm -hmm. And then you really look back and you cherish that one ring that you got. And, uh, and uh, you were world champion at one time. And a lot of guys can't say that. A lot of guys, you know, have several. And, and most of the players never get a chance to even get in that situation. You got friends of mine that played their whole career and never even got, never even got a chance to even make it the World Series. So you got to look back and say, okay, it would have been nice to win a couple more. But, man, that, that one was really nice and we were all appreciative of it. You sit back and look after you retired that you're appreciative of everything that was done and, and the guys that you played with and, and the fun you had, you know, a lot of Hall of Famers on that team. And, you know, I went on to San Diego and got to play with Trevor Hoffman, Ricky Henderson. Uh, and then my last year, uh, you know, Trevor Hoffman uh, uh, broke the all-time saves record when I was there before uh, Rivera broke it. And then Ricky Henderson, when I was in San Diego, broke the all-time runs record. And then in my last year playing, Barry, Barry Bonds broke the home run, the all-time home runs record. And so I was teammates all that to see it actually go down and actually drove Ricky Henderson in. Uh, with a, I think I hit a double in the gap and actually drove it, him in to tie the all times run record. And I actually made him s sign the uh, the ticket that night because Ricky didn't like to sign him a lot and, and neither did Barry. <laughs> so I was like, you, you got to sign this, man. I, I drove you in to tie the all time. And then the next, I think the next night, Ricky hit a home run to to break the all time runs record, actually to break it. And 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 I don't remember if most people, fans don't know, but it's, and, you know, living and playing in San Diego, three hour difference. But when he did that, he, he drove his own self in with a home run and he dove across home plate on a home run. Uh, the, the, the typical Ricky Henderson dive. I don't know. No one's ever seen anybody dive across home plate on a, a home run. Well, he did it that right. night. So that was pretty cool. Looking back on it all, I mean, obviously winning a World Series is way up there towards the top of your accomplishments, I'm sure, and, and memories. You had a wonderful career. But is the thing that you take more than anything – is the ability that you had to be on the teams with guys like you just mentioned, all those Hall of Famers, and looking back on your career, being on the same field, being on the same team with so many greats. Yeah, and I think that's more important. I mean, the individual goals, you know, is is all whatever you look back. So that way yeah, I had a good career. It was great, you know, and and had a good time. But I always look back and, and, and say, man, look how cool it was to play with those type of guys, to be teammates. Oh, Tony Gwynn. I was with Tony Gwynn for several years. 
I mean, I just look back and say, wow, what a blessing to build, to be with Clay. We play with so many guys. I mean, every year I've got guys got going to the Hall of Fame that I played with, you know, um, and it was, it was just an awesome, awesome experience. Um, got to have a, got a lot of play, got a lot, great baseball with a lot of, a lot of great players. And, and uh, you win some, you lose some, but those friendships that continue. Uh, I still talk to Barry, still talk to Chipper and, and Mad Dog. I go, when we go into Vegas, uh, you know, I'll call Mad Dog. We get together and play some poker or something. And so I, I you know, Javi, uh, when he's in town, but, you know, in, in the alumni stuff. So it's, it's great to be able to look back and have those friendships and, and to look back and, 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 and to just look at your whole career. And it's not in about individual stuff. And, I think it's about the, you know, the, the camaraderie we had to, with the rest, rest of the players. This might be an impossible question to answer with just one guy. But you give me as many guys as you want. But you mentioned so many incredible names, just uh, Hall of Famers and guys you played with. Who did you learn the most from just being around? Who had a baseball IQ that every time you're around that guy, you learned a lot about the game and, and maybe uh, tried to influence your own game with, with some of the things that you learned? <clears throat> Yeah, that is a good one. Uh, you know, when it come to, comes to learning a lot of stuff about what the pitcher's trying to do to me um, and, and actually become a better hitter later, especially later on in my career, was great. You know, uh, we played poker in some type of form of cards on the plane with Maddox, Smoltz, and, and Chipper and those guys. And so Maddox, Maddox was, and I always, always next to each other. And, and for him to kind of get an idea what the pitcher's minds are like and how they're trying to pitch me and what my approach is going to be, that helped my approach at the plate. Um, you know, with just being around Mad Dog all the time. And then later on in my career, obviously having Tony Gwynn, Tony Gwynn around. Um, I mean, J Justice and Ron Gant. Ron Gant was there for just a short while, but we played together in San Diego. He was a team leader. Um, and just – but Ronnie and Dave Justice took me under my wing – took, took – you know, me under their wing for the first couple of years and kind of showed me the ropes. And I was real appreciative of that. And then as I got older, I did the same, returned the favor, taking the guys to dinner, buying them some suits and helping them with the game. And and, you, and it's funny, a lot of the players receive it uh, and, and they and they take it in. And then it's funny, as you get older, you try to give some advice to some kids nowadays and, you know, they think they know it all. And, you know, you got, you know, I was your guy with got 10, 12, 14 years in and you're trying to give them advice and they just, they just kind of like shun you off. So um, it, it's kind of funny cause they, you know, when you're young and you think you're so good and then you don't take advice from, uh, from the veteran guys, uh, which doesn't happen very often, but I've seen it happen a few times with some other players. So it's actually pretty funny, but I'll tell you what, any, any time those guys like Tony Gwynn or Barry Bonds or, uh, you know, Dave justice, any of those guys give you some advice, you soak it in. And, and, uh, and that's why I think that that Braves team was so good. The communication of everybody in the dugout and you ask Chipper and justice and Javi, they didn't have a lot of video back then. They had some, you had to go really spend some time and, and you know, the big cassette tapes and all that, you know, the, <laughs> what are the VHS tapes, you had to go and plug them in and, and, and do the rewinding yourself. They didn't have all this stuff. So we spent hours upon hours in the video room and then talking, talking to each other in the dugout of, of um, what they're trying to do. So it was, it was me and Freddie, uh, Javi, uh, uh, Chipper, we're always talking in the dugout about what the pitchers, especially left-handed left-handers, are doing to left-handers right in. So we, there's a lot of communication. I think that's why we were so successful uh, when it comes to you know uh, getting the key hits and, and, and studying the pitcher. Chipper's really good. Chipper was really good about picking up pitches if the guy was doing something with his glove. Um, so it was it was communication. It wasn't a bunch of guys that thought they were so good uh, that they didn't need help. We always helped each other. Uh, even the pitchers uh, were always helping each other. Mad Dog. Uh, Avery, Smoltz, Glavin, they're always – we're around each other playing golf, and they communicated how to get guys out. I think that's why we – I really honestly can uh, really have, truly believe in my heart that that's why they were so successful, uh, because they communicated on, and, and they just – they studied the game a lot harder than some of these other teams. And furthermore, it seemed like you had the perfect manager for that group and Bobby. Am I right on that? Oh, yeah. I mean, he, I mean Bobby, most of the time he'd just come in, and if he saw something going on, you know – it step in, but it's mostly most of the time it was on cruise control. You know, he had some team leaders in the in the in the dugout, and 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 he was he was Bobby was really good about uh, team chemistry. And if you didn't fit in the Atlanta Braves mold and what he wanted or, or what the team wanted, then you were kind of in and out. You know, we traded for some players. They came in. I'm not going to say who. They came in. They were great players, and then next thing you know, they were out. 
It just didn't fit. Right. If, if, that, if that team chemistry wasn't there, uh, sometimes it wasn't that maybe that just he wasn't that wasn't the piece he was looking for. Maybe just it wasn't the attitude he was looking for, or him and John Sherholtz, or was it? It wasn't. It doesn't didn't fit in the Atlanta Braves way, and they didn't run him off. It just they would go find somebody else. Let me finish with this one. You talked about uh, teaching the game, and now you're coaching your son's team. How much are you enjoying that role, getting to share everything that you learned in a major league career with, with those young, young boys? That's funny because, you know, a lot of them, I don't know if they just forgot or they just thought that I, I had a lot of them come to the coach. You were on TV. I didn't know you played for the <laughs> Atlanta. They didn't know you played for the Atlanta Braves. They're like, we thought you played like in the minor leagues or something. So they actually got to watch me hit some home runs and stuff. So now I went to – so this is – I mean, with all this coronavirus stuff, we, we finally start running some light practices, you know, and keeping them up, keeping them apart. And then, so you, they're coming to me and they're like, oh, coach, you know, they, you know, we didn't know. We really didn't know. So I guess, I guess they, they thought – they knew that I played professionally somewhere, but they, some of them did and some of them didn't. But it was, it was pretty – so now, then now they're wanting to get, get close to me and talk to me about it. I'm like, back off, six, six feet away. <laughs> I'll tell you the story then. But, uh, you know, even the umpire, there's a great story with, with John Hirschbeck. I don't know, I think the second home run that I hit you, I was John back at the umpire um, about the balls and strikes, and then I hit the home run. So John, John Hirschbeck and I became, you know, friends and did some fishing and some events, you know, outdoor events together. And I said, hey, our altercation's on tonight. You need to watch. So he started laughing. And so, anyways, I would say, I, he, he, I said, the ball's inside. He said, no, it's not. So we, we were kind of yelling back and forth. It was a pretty big strike zone in the World Series. I don't know if you realize that. Pretty dang, for, for the most part. There's a couple of them that were tight. Right. But it's pretty dang, it was a, it, and there wasn't a whole lot of runs scored. Not be, I mean, there was some great pitching. But when you, got, when you got Hall of Fame type pitchers getting more than an inch or two off the plate, and now it's maybe, maybe a ball length off, it's hard to hit those type of caliber, caliber pitches. But anyways, so, you know, after you, you get – a couple caught off the plate, you know, you start getting a little bit angry. Well, I, I just got done saying the ball was inside. He said, no, it wasn't. And I said, yes, it was. It was way inside. And then the next pitch I hit out. So I'm running around the bases talking to myself. I'm still mad about the pitch he called before on me. When I hit home plate, I looked at the umpire and I said, it was still a ball. And he loved that. <laughs> and we, we became friends after that. He loved it. He's like, that's awesome. You, you're still, you said, you, you hit the home run of Woods, you stepped on home plate, you looked at me, still pissed off, going, it's still a ball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and in that home run, that's when you had the little bat flip before bat flips are even cool, right? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know what's going on. Bit. I think I, I was just so mad about, so mad about the pitches and some of the pitches that were getting called on some of us. I, guess. I don't know. But to, yeah, a little bit of a kind of a bat flip there and there. I, they were giving me crap. I know I, Tomei had one and, and uh, that we almost went – he flipped it. It almost rolled into our dugout. And I, I know David Jess was pretty pissed off about that. They are saying I, that he was getting back at the one that I had. I guess we were trading bat flips. But uh, uh, it, it, was, it was cool to go back and look. And, and, and later on, I, you know, Dennis Martinez, we were teammates with him. I got, and then several – some of these guys, uh, Kenny Lofton came over. Uh, Dennis Martinez got – you know, and so a lot of these guys were teammates, the guys I played with later on in my career. So it's pretty cool to go back and relive some of those moments. Um, and, and see a lot of that stuff. Well, Ryan, it was a, a blast to visit with you today. We appreciate you taking the time to, to join us. Love hearing the stories, man. And uh, we get an opportunity to do this again really soon. Yes, sir. Thank you.